well, I hate introducing myself <laughs> that. Um, but so I don't have to because I actually made a little video. I'm not a tech uh, when it comes to uh, uh, productions and things, but I put a, a, together a few of the highlights of my career coming from junior sports right up through the Bobsa, the Winter Olympics, and it was actually four years today that I competed in Sochi. So our, our Bobsa team is currently on the ice over in Penong Chain right now. And I wish I was there, but obviously it's better to be here talking to you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's warmer. It is indeed. So here's a little video. Have a little look because I often get asked what's it what's it like to do bobsled. And um, I know Mike's heard this before, but and seen this before. But I actually held a little um, camera in the back of the sled so that you actually get to feel what it feels like to be in the back of a bobsled. And this is the best room to recruit new bobsledders. Okay, because track and field athletes make the best bobsledders and, and it's a really incredible sport. One, it's a team sport, so it's like being in a relay the whole time, which is really, really nice. Um, but we also do make good athletes because of our power and our strength and our speed. So if you do have a young kid who's maybe not quite hitting the mark where you think they should, um, really consider moving them across because it's, it means an Olympic Games for them because the, the performances we need to rate, elevate a little bit, but it's a much easier sport to get into than the track and field um, and it's a hell of a ride. So <laughs> enjoy. right after um, the London Olympics. So my the way I thought we'd run today is actually there's a piece of paper on all of your shit on your chair. So that was me putting that piece of paper down. Yeah. So we're gonna actually do it as a game. So I do a lot of this with um, with corporates and for young development people trying to come into uh, to try and achieve big goals in life. But I thought we'd do it as a coach, but you can either do it as your as yourself in your coaching career or you can think about doing this with one of your athletes. And I think it's really poignant trying to achieve great things in sport or anything in life. So if you get your piece of paper, and I want you to write down, please, your number one goal for you and your number one goal for one and all your squad as athletes on that piece of paper. This as well, but we'll start off with a little story that I wrote out of my book, and I thought it would be very interesting because we're sitting in the stadium of the Commonwealth Games in less than 50 days, is it? How long? 
currently getting held to the Peacock Banks. 49, Still, okay. Yeah. How is it? Yeah. Sure. Don't know. Oh, come 46. on, guys. How long to the Commonwealth Games? 46. Sorry? 46. 46 days till the Commonwealth Games. So I thought I would get you guys to envision what it feels like to win a Commonwealth Games title. Has anyone in this room actually won a Commonwealth Games title? No? Been to a Commonwealth Games? No? Olympics? A couple Olympic athletes? Okay. Well, obviously. <laughs> uh, right, but well, what I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to close your eyes and we're going to picture what it feels like to win the Commonwealth. So this was actually written for when I won the World Championships in Paris 2003, but we've adapted it to be what it's gonna feel like for someone special in this stadium in 46 days, okay? So give your eyes a close, have a little break if you've got up really early, and I'm gonna put you right in the feeling of what it, what, of what it feels like to win a Commonwealth Games gold medal. Waking. You instantly know it is the day. You have waited what feels like a life so hard it overwhelms your other senses. People say it's like butterflies. <coughs> this is more like giant tigers clawing away at your insides. This is judgment day. Have you pushed hard enough? Was there a stone left unturned? The reality continues to hit you in perfectly timed waves as a shiver runs down your spine and you realize this utter fear of coursing through your veins. The day drags on. You do the usual routine of lounging around the village, picking at your breakfast, Fluffing around with your race kit, playing cards. You win some, you lose some. Back to the dining room for more food shuffling, but mainly you watch the clock. Tick, tock, tick, tock away. It's agony. Finally, 4 p.m. arrives, and from that moment on, your life is in fast forward, flying past in a blur. Before you know it, you're plugging in your headphones, Rocky Eye of the Tiger, setting the pace for your warm up. It's a fabulous evening to be racing. The weather is perfect, warm and windless here on the Gold Coast. You remember, you remember all the hours of sweat and tears that you poured into your program. Then the stadium radio bursts into life. Could the participants in the 400 metre hurdles final please make your way to the call room? Boom, those tiger claws return in full force. You collect your things, you check your bib numbers and slip into the call room. It's just a small demountable room set up for the games, but somehow it feels so daunting. Eight empty white seats, no pictures and a loo at one end. Each of the athletes files into the room, has their names and numbers marked off and takes their seats. Everyone is fidgeting, knees bouncing, eyeing each other off. Some of them act like they own, they own the place, jumping up and down, yelling out, running on the spot. Others hide in the corner. You, you just sit and watch. You don't have long to wait when you're escorted out to the next holding station, your spikes and bags checked again, your lane numbers allocated. They've given you lucky lane number five. Then out you go into the enormous stadium with 80,000 people screaming their hearts out and ringing the cowbells and banging on the advertising signs. The Aussies sure know how to put on a show. The hurdles are out already, neatly, neatly set, officials dressed in white guarding them like prized possessions. You take a deep, slow breath and picture yourself flying across them. All the nerves of the day, the stress and the pressure floats away into the crowds, leaving you bulletproof and ready. The competition arena, this is your playground. The starter calls you to the blocks. You strip off your green and gold Aussie tracksuit and readjust your shoelaces. On your marks. Oh my God, here we go. Come on, come on, relax. Get set. Oh, please, please execute. Don't stuff this up. Bang. You push out out of the blocks and there's 10 hurdles to conquer. And the first race is up to you. The back straight follows pretty quickly and soon you're halfway around the 400 meter track. The European champion Olympic medalist Natasha Danvers is on the lane outside you. you went, she went out like free beer. By the 250, she's now two metres in front. You can feel the Jamaican going stride for stride on the other side with you as you fight across that hurdle. Come on, come on, fight with your heart, push, push. The Jamaican drops back and it's just you on the hot, hot on the heels of the Brit. She's a beast, her muscles ripple with every stride. You both approach the final turn with 100 metres to go and then it happens. You watch as she simply loses all her power. Her legs slow down and her stride shortens. Her tank is empty. Changing gears, you set out for the kill. With every metre, your target draws closer. With only one final barrier left to conquer, you glide over that last hurdle and dig so deep, your lungs feel like the fire is literally burning through them. The line approaches swiftly and you push out in front. The other girl's panting hard all around you. Come on, keep pushing, push, don't give up now. Ignore the heaviness in your legs and the fire in your lungs. The noise in the stadium erupts beyond belief. It is deafening as you throw your chest across that finish line, blasting through first. First, yes, you heard it. First, number one, the Commonwealth champion. On this day, you made history for Australia. Thank you.
Giants. Congratulations, you're all Commonwealth champions. <laughs> What's the best part about winning a Commonwealth Games or the Olympics or anything of that level? Relief. Relief, yes. What about this thing? To me, that's the best part about um, what we do every day. We train as athletes to be the best in the world or the best in our country or the best in Australia. And I was really lucky that I heard this nine times during my career. So a couple of world juniors, a couple of world championship seniors and one class. But, just like that finish, I can never stop during an end. It was too beautiful. <laughs> very often for Australians, doesn't we don't hear it in the Olympics very often, so. Sochi Olympics, what happened? You can tell what happened. Well, I use it as my analogy that you got very, very, very close to making an amazing performance and it just kind of backfired at the very end. So it's the Sochi Olympics where they, they, they were supposed to have a beautiful five rings, obviously, and one of them just, just didn't quite get there all the day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the opening ceremony Olympic rings from, uh, from my Russian experience. So, yeah, and you can imagine that Putin received some pretty backfiring information of that. So every athlete's dream growing up is to win the Olympics. So, you know, I remember meeting, um, I was standing next to Daley Thompson when I was, 18 years of age and he turned around to me and said one day you're going to be the greatest 400 hurdle the world's ever seen and you always think what is that going to look like for you and for me it was all I would want it was to win the Olympic Games and it didn't happen so I have had to really focus on and I like to share with other athletes what are the few things that we can do or what are the things that hold you back from achieving something that's great so you can look at this from a coaching perspective what do you do and what are the things that you hold back on when delivering performance for your athletes and what are the things in, as an athlete or as some of your athletes that you coach with what are the things that you can improve on gently or hard you know in a, in a harsh manner to make their performance the best that they can have so this is me at the olympic games it's not working sort of thing um, and that's right before athens so i was running in zurich in 2004 some of you will remember this story but I was reigning world champion after 2003, I'd won in the par at Paris and I was 20. And um, Debbie Flintoff King, I was running so fast, I was undefeated that season that Phil King, who was my coach, flew his wife, the Australian um, record holder and Olympic champion, to come and watch me in the Zurich Golden League. And during the warm up, I felt this amazing, massive crack in my right knee and my meniscus popped three and a half weeks before Athens. So all in a heartbeat, all that work and years and years and hours of training was just disappeared, disappeared overnight. So I went to the Olympics, you can see, um, but I came fifth. And whilst most athletes would absolutely love to come fifth in the Olympic Games, for me it was the most heartbreaking day I'd ever had. So I still wake up and think that I'm back in that experience. So I thought I'd put that one up. This was, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> well guys, I know I'm medical, Achilles, exactly. Achilles. So I like to use this one because for me, it's about focusing on what is your Achilles heel in your life in terms of as a coach or as an athlete. So my Achilles heel, and once you work, work out what that is, you can then make a change for it. So this is going in World Championships and Commonwealths, and then again, exactly the same thing, I ruptured my Achilles leading into the Beijing Olympics. So two Olympics in a row, reigning world champion going into both, and lost the Olympics both times. So for me now, I have to focus on why did that happen? So it gets to a point where the things, when something happens, what the first time it's an accident, the second time you start got to focus on what, what, what were the reasons for those happening. So what I'd like you to do now, game part two of the game, is to write down some things that you are aware of as a coach, or particularly common in your group of athletes, that two, two things, so there's two little columns. On one side I want you to write the things that you cannot change. So the things like, for example, if you've got a young athlete who has to go to university and school, and I'm very, very strong on that, has to maintain. You do not, the children have to have a backup plan in what they're doing. Or it might be things like finances. You can't afford not to work as well as be a coach. So on one, on the left-hand column, I want you to write things that are gonna hold you back and potentially not get the best out of you, but that you can't change. And the things on the, the other column, and I'm gonna share with you what mine were, which is hard to do, but I want you to be able to learn from my mistakes things on the right hand column that are things that you could potentially make a difference and make a change to. So we're going to continue building on this in the next 10 minutes as we go through mine. There's a few of them you might say, uh-huh, that's me too. And oh yeah, I've got that as well. So left hand column, things you cannot change but are going to interfere with your career as a coach or as an athlete. 
and on the right hand side column things that you can definitely make a difference and change. No one's going to see your answers either, guys. No, it was so quick and so, so quick and so blurred. And, 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 and I just wanted to embarrass Fitzy, which he did. Congratulations to me. <laughs> Are you stuck in your ways with what you're doing coaching? Are you prepared to learn from another? Do you know when your limits are and you can pass the athlete on to someone else? Or share coaching? I'll give it another 30 seconds. Send the Bob sleds on today. Yeah. Oh, must say the results. Interesting. Come soon. Yeah. It'll be Canada again. Canada and then Germany. Uh -huh. All right, guys. So, I love this little analogy. You might have heard it before, but this is basically where I got to after Beijing. So to lose to lose another Olympic Games, to then sit there and I love this little story. So you're walking along a river and there's somebody drowning. You jump in the river, you pull them out, give them life to life resuscitation and they're fine and they're you know, good. You just keep walking a little bit on the river again. You see another person floating down the river. You jump in again, you save them, pull them onto the, onto the, uh, on the bank, and then another person's coming down and another person's coming down. So you spend all afternoon diving in and saving these poor people coming out of the water. What's a better alternative? Teach them to swim. Teach them to swim, that's a good one. <laughs> How about walking up the river and see who's pushing them in in the first place? Stop it before it happens. So becoming really aware, as we've just done, of the things that are, that are possibly pushing us into the water in the deep end and making us swim like a duck underwater is really important. So for me, I have to, and I'm very honest, I have to, I have to focus on the fact that my offside track, so outside of athletics, there's no doubt, I know I'm being arrogant saying this, there's no doubt athletically and genetically I was, was made to be a track and field athlete. That's what I was put on this planet to do. But sometimes my psychology wasn't in line and matching my athletic ability. So being aware of that, and it took me a long time to learn this, is something that's really important. So obviously as a coach, you can make a decision whether you're able to read your athletes very well and how you can change that. But also being aware that all athletes have a really big personal life on the side that needs to be looked after and cuddled as much as they do as an athlete. And I really believe that a lot of coaches miss this point. I've had brilliant coaches all my life, but the one area that is always difficult, and actually Mike was very good at this, was being aware that there is a real athlete person alongside that person who runs on the track. So I had a really yucky divorce that I hid behind and affected my performance. So for those people that you surround yourself with, so making sure your athlete is very, very, you're very careful with who they pick in terms of their friendship networks and who they train with. So having a buddy in training, for example, is essential because it's a very, very lonely world and the type of personalities that go into support into sport make us actually more vulnerable than most. So I don't know if you saw the Insight program, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit later. The Insight program where a lot of athletes, Lauren Jackson, Barry Hall, myself, Libby Trickett, we've all come out and said how hard it was during sport from a mental health perspective because it's so lonely. It's really hard to maintain that level for so long. So divorce got in the way, definitely, of my Olympics. And when I was talking about my Achilles heel before, 100% my problem was that my relationships off the track were so tumultuous that I would be up till two or three in the morning worrying about what was happening and then get to the track the next morning and be absolutely smashed and tired. And your body knows no difference between the cortisol levels of producers off the track as to what's happening on a training session. So having that ability to train smarter rather than harder on a day when an athlete is really struggling, for me is vital and we keep missing that point. So just literally having a five second conversation before training and saying what happened yesterday overnight, whether you want to do it scientifically doing blood lactates and temperatures and checking for things like that, that's your choice. But a simple conversation is so easy to have and it's so often missed. Um, and for me, finding out, I lost five babies during my athletics career trying to have children and that mental impact of that was really difficult. So just being really aware of the off track life. And look, there are some athletes, don't get me wrong, who have the complete opposite, who, um, sorry, Sally Pearson is one of these, who may have a something happening off the track and ends up running beautifully as a result of it. And that's what I was like for the first half of my career. So if you've actually watched me up until I was about 24, no injuries, nothing, nothing going wrong because I used all the anger and anything that happened at, at, at home and put it into training and that went really well. But I believe once you get past about 25, that doesn't happen anymore when your body goes into just aging, just general aging and being able to maintain both is really difficult. You're, you're like, Okay. Nicely aged. Nicely aged, yes. I'm, I'm old now too, so I'm in that category. 
Yeah, so for me, again, as I said, smarter is not harder. One of the biggest things I have to focus on in my career as well, and any of our really top athletes are the same, is I did not have an off button. So being able to understand that it's to, that is enough, you've done enough training, rather than walking that razor blade for so long. So I had to be really aware that if my coach gave me 10 reps, if I felt good at eight, eight was enough. And some believe that eight is better than 10, you could give me an answer to that. But for me, I had to be really aware that I overtrained. I was a chronic overtrainer, and it came around because I had I had such a guilty conscience. And I don't know why, but being able to conquer that was something I really had to learn, both in my current medical studies and in my future athletics, uh, future career as bobsled. I love little, a little uh, analogy, so I'll go with one more, because this is something I learned early in my career, but I thought maybe could be a potential for some of your athletes. Um, who here watches, uh, what's the show called, with the, the lawyers? Oh, I'm having a mental blank. It doesn't matter. It Coats. came from, hey? Suits. Suits, thank you. <laughs> Suits, yeah. So I don't know, when I had my little baby about a year ago, I watched this great program, um, Suits, which I love, and there was an analogy that came up, and there was this guy that was driving on the side of the road, he got a, he had a flat tire, so he got out of the car and realised he had no jack in the car, so couldn't couldn't change the tires. Anyone heard, seen that episode? No? Okay, so good. So he had a, had a flat tire, realised he couldn't change it, it was in the middle of nowhere, it was five kilometres to the nearest house, so he thought, all right, I'll walk back to the house and I'll ask them if they have a jack to change the tire. So he got out and he started walking and then about 100 metres into the walk, he's like, what if I don't have a jack and I've walked all this way for nothing? Oh, no, no, well, I've got to do something. So I kept walking a kilometre in and he's like, what if they have a jack and they don't let me use it? Oh, no, I don't know. I kept walking another kilometre. And he got all the way to the house, having all these conversations in his head, little voices saying this, that and the other. And by the time he got to the house, he's like, I bet you they're going to charge me 500 bucks to use the jack. And like, he was really going setting himself nuts. And he knocked on the door, and this lovely little old lady opens the door and he goes, I don't want your damn jack! Slammed the door in his face and walked off. <laughs> you get the principle of that? So he convinced himself prior to it even happening of what the outcome was going to be. And as coaches, we do this a lot of the performance that we have no control over, because you can't control them once they're on the track or on the, in the pit. And as an athlete, we do it all the time. And I share one little example. Um, this was actually me racing Freeman, one of the best days of my life. Come on, turn on and your idol. <laughs> it was amazing. But prior to this event, the very first time I actually got to run against Kathy Freeman, I was about 16 years of age, and I no, it was the first time I got to do a Grand Prix. And I flew over, actually, I did Perth first, and then I flew to Adelaide to race against Kathy and Lee Naylor and Nova Paris and a lot of Tams and Lewis. Like, oh, you know, as a young kid, this was like, oh my God, event. Um, and I remember going down to the track and just thinking, I'm going to do what. So uh, Jackie Burns was coaching me then and said, do nothing except what I tell you, because she couldn't come to that event. Just the warm up, it's very simple, it's just like little A's, and there's nothing different here. <laughs> Follow the program and you'll be fine. <laughs> but I saw Freeman start warming up 90 minutes before the start of the race, and I thought, oh, well, if she's doing it, I'm going to do it too. So I followed her around the track, and then. Um, she started doing some stretching. I did the stretching, she did the run-throughs, I did the run-throughs. I literally decided to throw my plan completely out the window and do exactly what Kathy did, because she was my idol. Um, in fact, we got, went into the call room and we were sitting down there and she went to the toilet, so I went with her. So I literally sat the with the next to her. I didn't need to go up there, but she was going, so. Anyway, and so in that moment, when I was sitting in that bathroom, this little voice got in my head and started saying, you're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to be a laughing stock. She's going to lap you. <laughs> I do that pain. But my voice was completely convinced that little that little devil on my shoulder that I was going to, to humiliate myself in the stadium. In fact, I lost so much courage that I never left the bathroom. So I heard my name going, Yana Pittman, Pittman, where are you? And in fact, I didn't run the race at all. So it wasn't until the gun went that I came out in Adelaide and watched the race of my life go behind before me and I'd missed an opportunity to run against my idol. So that moment there, I was so overcome by fear. I was 16, 16, 17 that I vowed it would never, ever, 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 ever happen again. And then what, four years later I beat her. So it was a matter of having an opportunity to understand that every single athlete you coach will have a vulnerability and be very, very scared of something. And as a, as a coach and as an athlete, being aware that that is okay. And once you make, so I often get asked why, what was your mentality going into an Olympics or a Commonwealth final or something like that? And my, my attitude literally came down to get rid of that stupid little sabotaging voice because you're going to do it anyway, so if you're not going to walk out of the event, because I've done it before. So you might have an athlete who actually does feel like that. So if you have someone who doesn't really rise to performance, and I can think, I'll be honest with you, I can think of a few in Australia that could actually do with an experience like this. Stop them racing once when it really counts. Make them sit on the sideline and watch their competitors do what they wish they were doing and it'll never happen again. Because you'll realise it's their choice to be in this competition, it's their choice to be an athlete, it's your choice to be a coach. And once they take ownership of that choice and get rid of that little voice, it'll make a huge difference in their performance. 
okay? What is the difference and what is the similarity between these two athletes? Firstly, what are they both? Something I'm not. Who have we got? Debbie Flintoff King, Christo Christina Ogaruga. Both Olympic champions. Both Olympic champions. What is the difference between this one and this one if you look at their physique? Let's be honest, we're just in a room of being real here. Flintoff's ripped and... Uh, and she is not, she let's be honest. Yeah. Yes. Yep, it's I've had this competition a lot. Are they both be the best in the world? Yes. So many times, and I was caught in this, this was one of my biggest weaknesses and one of the reasons I got into so many problems as an athlete, and it's probably what, what it reflected in my career and, I'm, and I really want to share it with you today. Oops, wrong way. <clears throat> this is me winning the World Genius, a little bit chunky, world champion in Paris. One year later, with a skin fold of 30, 32, got down to 28 within six weeks of this performance. And what did happen? What happened here that didn't happen here? I won here. I'm the best in the world. Here I'm injured, out, gone, Olympics over. And this happened so many times to me in my career where I fixated on weight too much. Don't get me wrong, there were times when I was too big and I had to lose it. We are athletes and it's our job. But it became such a, a predominant part of my career that it, it that it that it that it re I really paid for it. And I mentor young girls now, a lot of young girls now on eating issues, and it's rife within our sport. Mm -hmm. So we need as coaches to be extraordinarily careful how we talk to our young women about our weight. So I had to bring it up today because it was one of my factors why I didn't win the Olympic Games because mentally it caught me and it was too too challenging to get over. So particularly our male coaches, I really think you need to be really careful with how we talk to them. Absolutely, we need to lose weight. We can't be fat athletes. No, skin folds of 40 is minimum, but 32 is too low. And it's so hard because you get caught up in this that you're only gonna win the Olympics yeah. if you look like that. But she's an Olympic champion too. And I'm a world champion in the middle and I'm not that lean. I'm good, but I'm not ripped to the absolute max. Can so, I just ask a question? Um, at any of those times, are you happy or not happy? With the yeah, great question. Yeah. So here I had no idea. I knew what food and how important it was. I ate very, very well. Yeah. And I still had a few few occasional moments where I eat like too much ice cream and be like, oh my God, I'm on a real issue. But I wasn't, I was happy. I was in a really, really good place because my performance was extraordinary. Yeah. Like I won everything I put my, you know, put my mind to. Yeah. Whereas at this point here, I looked like I should break the world record, yeah. but I was not able to train at the same level. And I was, my, I was consumed with fear of being overweight and the performance not being linked. Yes, and it's really hard because a lot of athletes run their best at a certain weight and then think that's why they ran well. No, it's actually because they have a damn good coach yeah. and because they work hard at training. So I'm not saying you can be fat, but I'm saying if you could have a, a good balance, it makes a real difference. And it, Sorry, like, Yana, if you had an athlete that you cared about and she yeah. was really obviously to you overweight, yeah. how would you broach the topic I'd with her? I'd take for walks with her. And, and do what? Just talk walk about what? Her. Walk it off. Walk so walk off. it off. Yeah, that's my opinion. So yeah. because Why don't you if she doesn't realise that she's overweight and she thinks she's cooking with gas you know but is she cooking with gas my honor if she's not cooking with gas in her performance then you talk about performance so for me if if, if her performance isn't like my world juniors like I, was, I, was, I was like 70 this uh, don't laugh here but i was like 73 kilos there as a young girl 18 <laughs> huge chunky monkey <laughs> um by here i'm already 69 and by here i'm 66 so six foot tall at 66 kilos is just crazy but do you let that do you let the athlete herself Determine do you let the penny course. drop with her and let her make her own decisions? Or do you at any stage say, listen, honey, you've got to slim down a bit? Like we did. Mm. So you, you let you know, I'd let them know that their that weight is important. Um, and obviously, you can't, it's it's part of... Power to body weight Power to body weight is yeah. very important. But if their performance is going well and they're carrying a bit more weight, I think well, you're better off having a happy performing athlete than an injured athlete that feels like shit. 100%. That's the truth. And I think sometimes we guess particularly in Australia. Europe's very different. Europe, they don't focus on this anywhere as much, although their athletes maybe don't, you know, they are not necessarily as clean as ours, but um, there are certain means to, to, to be able to, as you say, communicate with an athlete. And I think a lot of the time we are so fixated on performance coming from what you look like rather than performance coming from the times you're seeing on the track and what you're jumping. And look, it's just a little thing and I just wanted to bring it up because it was, for me, as we're saying here, it was on my list, on my left, on my right-hand column, it was something I could have done something about but I wasn't aware of it till too late. Yeah, no, we go back to that yep. stuff, Okay. What is the difference and what is the similarity between these two athletes? Firstly, what are they both? Something I'm not. Who have we got? 
Danny Flintoff King, Christina Ogaruga. Both Olympic champions. Both Olympic champions. What is the difference between this one and this one if you look at their physique? Let's be honest, we're just in a room of being real here. Flintoff's ripped and... Uh, and she is not, she let's be honest. Yes. Yeah. Yep, this one I've had this conversation a lot. Are they both be the best in the world? Yes. So many times, and I was caught in this, this was one of my biggest weaknesses and one of the reasons I got into so many problems as an athlete, and it's probably what, what it reflected in my career and my life, and I really want to share it with you today. Oops, wrong way. <clears throat> this is me winning the World Genius, a little bit chunky, world champion in Paris. One year later, with a skin fold of 30, 32, got down to 28 within six weeks of this performance. And what did happen? What happened here that didn't happen here? I won here. I'm the best in the world. Here I'm injured, out, gone, Olympics over. And this happened so many times to me in my career where I fixated on weight too much. Don't get me wrong, there were times when I was too big and I had to lose it. We are athletes and it's our job. But it became such a predominant part of my career that it, it, that it, that it, that it really, I really paid for it. And I mentor young girls now, a lot of young girls now on eating issues, and it's rife within our sport. Mm -hmm. So we need, as coaches, to be extraordinarily careful how we talk to our young women about our weight. So I had to bring it up today because it was one of my factors why I didn't win the Olympic Games. Because mentally it caught me and it was too, too challenging to get over. So particularly our male coaches, I really think you need to be really careful with how we talk to them. Absolutely, we need to lose weight. We can't be fat athletes. No, skin folds of 40 is minimum, but 32 is too low. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard because you get caught up in this that you're only going to win the Olympics yeah. if you look like that. But she's an Olympic champion too. And I'm a world champion in the middle and I'm not that lean. I'm good, but I'm not ripped to the absolute max. Can so, I just ask a question? Um, at any of those times, were you happy or not happy? Was you... Yeah, great question. Yeah. So here I had no idea. I knew what food and how important it was. I ate very, very well. And I still had a few few occasional moments where I eat like too much ice cream and be like, oh my God, I'm gonna really shoot. But I wasn't, I was happy. I was in a really, really good place because my performance was extraordinary. Yeah. Like I won everything I put my, you know, put my mind to. Whereas at this point here, I look like I should break the world record, yeah. but I was not able to train at the same level. And I was, my, I was consumed with fear of being overweight and the performance not being linked. Yes, and it's really hard because a lot of athletes run their best at a certain weight and then think that's why they ran well. No, it's actually because they have a damn good coach yeah. and because they work hard at training. Yeah. So I'm not saying you can be fat, but I'm saying if you could have a, a good balance, it makes a real difference. And it, Sorry, right. Yana, if you had an athlete that you cared about and she yeah. was really obviously to you overweight, yeah. how would you broach the topic I'd with her? I'd take for walks with her. And, and do what? Just talk walk about what? Walk it off. Walk so walk off. it off. Yeah, that's my opinion. So yeah. because why don't you? What... She doesn't realise that she's overweight and she thinks she's cooking with gas. You know. But is she cooking with gas? My honour. If she's not cooking with gas in her performance, then you talk about performance. So for me, if if, if her performance isn't like my world juniors, like I, was, I, was, I was like seventy. This uh, don't laugh here, but I was like seventy three kilos there as a young girl, eighteen. <laughs> oh, huge chunky monkey. <laughs> um, by here I'm already sixty nine, and by here I'm sixty six. So six foot tall at 66 kilos is just crazy. But do you let that? Do you let the athlete herself? Determine do you let the penny course. drop with her and let her make her own decisions, or do you at any stage say, "Listen, honey, you've got to slim down a bit." Like we did. Mm. So you, you let me. You know, I'd let them know that their that weight is important. Um, and obviously, you can't. It's it's part of power and body weight. Power ratio. body weight is yeah. very important. But if their performance is going well and they're carrying a bit more weight, I think we well, are better off having a happy performing athlete than an injured athlete that feels like shit. Hundred percent. That's the truth. And I think sometimes we guess, particularly in Australia, Europe's very different. Europe, they don't focus on this anywhere as much, although their athletes maybe don't. You know, they are not necessarily as clean as ours. But um, there are certain means to, to to be able to, as you say, communicate with an athlete. And I think a lot of the time we are so fixated on performance coming from what you look like rather than performance coming from the times you're seeing on the track and what you're jumping. And look, it's just a little thing and I just wanted to bring it up because it was, for me, as we're saying here, it was on my list, on my left, on my right hand column, it was something I could have done something about, but I wasn't aware of it till too late. Yeah, no, we, we go back to back from achieving their high, their goals in sport. Mental fitness. Mental fitness, yeah. It's my biggest one. So my, my Honestly, the reason I didn't win the Olympics was because I wasn't strong enough off the track. Really is a fact. I mean, I did get injured a lot, but I think my injury came about because of the fact that I wasn't strong enough controlling things around around in my life outside of sport. 
Anyone else want to volunteer some? To be to be too distracted and uh, rather than stay um, onto their process. On target. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and they, they think that they're the only one scared. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And Michael, jo Michael Johnson's book's really good for that too. And David Henry's, I don't know if you guys have read Another, oh, Another Hurdle by David Henry. He's the Olympic 84 Olympic champion of water hurdles in Britain. An amazing book to give your athletes. It's really good about teaching. He, he said he honestly believes he wouldn't have won the Olympic Games if the gun hadn't have gone off because he was so nervous in his box he was ready to piss himself. And thankfully it was a false start and he then won the Olympics by 15 metres. It's a really cool book to give athletes who feel nervous. Anyone else you want to share? David Henry, it's David Henry and it's called uh, Another Hurdle, I think it is. Fabulous, you can buy it on Amazon. Does anyone else want to share what they, what about something you personally need to change about yourself as a coach? Cool. It's holding you back well, from your athletes achieving? Financial considerations, yeah, having, to, having, yeah. having to work. Unfortunately, it's something we can't change. Isn't yeah. it? And a lot of athletes will have the same thing. They have a lot of finances, and that's, that, goes in, that goes in the left-hand column of something you can't alter. What about things you can change? Personal family problems. Yep, absolutely. And again, I, you, you can't always alter that. And a lot, and every outcome, there cannot be an athlete in, in your squad that's not going to go through a relationship breakdown or something like that. And you can't tell your athlete not to date. <laughs> It'd be the ideal, but it's not going to work. And they, yeah. they Being prepared to have conflict with your athlete. That's fabulous. Really good one. Not just sort of going like yep. you've got to keep it all nice and calm. Absolutely. And res conflict resolution is really important as well because you're right, the best coaches become like lovers almost with your athlete because you are so close and intimate in the way you deal with things and being able to resolve that is really important. But that again comes down to making sure that you're able to hear what they say as well because it's, it, you can make such a difference if you know what's going on behind the scenes. Anything Parents, else? I reckon for juniors in Parents, particular. Yeah. Massive problem, isn't it? <laughs> well, Anyone else has parent play everyone's laughing at parent parent problems? <laughs> I hope I'm not going to be a parent problem as my son comes through. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Oh, she so is. She's going to be a pain in the ass. Yeah. Anything else? One more. Yeah, I'll say one, which we yeah. sort of captured those two. We talked about difficult conversations. Yeah. You know, and our culture in Australia, we don't actually, we don't like conflict. You know, we tend to avoid and shy away from it because we don't want to have those difficult conversations. Yeah. But it's how you have those conversations. You, you should be calm having those conversations so you're not too emotional. Exactly. But we're not trained actually how to help people actually be better at dealing with those difficult conversations. Yes. And that's good, but it's also, it's sadly, it's our cultural shift. And I'm sure you guys have all seen it that 15 years ago you could have said something to an athlete that you can't say now. Yeah. And it's the same in school, it's the same in medicine. Like, I can't call one of my patients overweight to go and lose weight anymore. It's diplomatically incorrect and you can't do it. Even though a lady will come to me saying she hasn't been pregnant for 10 years, she's trying really, really hard to get pregnant. She's sitting with in front of me and she's morbidly obese. And if she just lost weight, she'd be pregnant within six months. But you can't say it. You have to be very diplomatic in the way we talk. And it's the same with everything. You can't body coddle children, you can't, because no one wants to be a champion and be the, you know, the, the one that stands out. Everyone has to be equal nowadays. But the difficulty is that that's not going to change. So we have to learn to work in that environment and train our athletes and talk to our coaches and talk to people in a, in, the, in a way that still gets the best out of them. So that's what's cool is the next thing we're gonna talk about is actually that. So when we discuss things like fear or weight or things like that, we need to address what's gonna happen for that person in that setting when we're talking to them about it. So this comes about, and this works in, this is an amazing little analogy, but it works beautifully for both competitions. So we're talking about athletes here who cannot perform under pressure. Who has one of those in their group? The most talented person you can think of, put them on a track and they shit themselves, right? Or who has not seen one of those? Everyone has a one, right? I was that athlete against Freeman in my first race. <laughs> I didn't even make it to the start line, so. But at least you're in the toilet. I was in the toilet, yeah, <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> Yes, but it's called the pain, fear, tension syndrome. So what I'm going to get you guys to do is hold your left hand really, really tight. Really, 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 really tight and just hold it there for a second. So this comes about um, as the way your body works with stress, okay? So if you're talking to a young athlete about their weight or if you're talking about their performance or you're talking about their family and their parents and you just want their mother to leave them alone and not have an involvement, whatever it is, it's going to create a tension in their body. Okay, so release your hand. And what does that feel like? Relief. What does what does the wave feel like? It's like a tingling and yeah. So when we talk about things or when we do things that are stressful, our body is like tense like this, and then we feel pain more. So for a 400 runner, you're tense. You feel pain in the last 100 meters. 
or if you're talking to someone about something that's really important and you need to get across to them but it's very, very difficult to talk about, this situation sets in. But you can feel when your body relaxes how much more strength you have in that hand and how much relief there is. So when we're in a situation, we really, really, really need to be aware. It's just a conscious awareness that the that, that stress and tense will give you really crap, piss poor performance. So it's a thing that we often forget as coaches and as athletes, but just doing that exercise with your athletes will allow them to understand the relationship between tension, pain and stress and what the outcome could be. You get tired, your hand is relieved when it's released. And we carry this all day, every day in our lives, driving you know, in the car, all day we work at a really high tense pressure and all it is is just relaxing. Now we remind our athletes all the time, relax, running, relax, run off your shoulders, all of that sort of stuff. We need to make sure that when we're talking to someone when we're actually working together, we do the same thing. And it's a little simple exercise like this of just making them aware that we need to relax. And it's the same thing, not that you didn't know this, but because I work as a gynecologist, same thing in childbirth. We have women, you see in the labors, tears, obstructed labor, cesareans, all of that sort of stuff because they're holding on to that tension and they're just not letting go. So we need to encourage our people to really, really be aware of this syndrome and then relax and let it go. I to give to all the athletes. Has anyone seen this before? The elastic band theory? Okay. So this one, this is how I would teach a young athlete to lose weight. So I put it on their wrist and I'd say, you're having problems with weight. Every time you want to overeat, it's usually an emotional reaction. So if you're trying to reduce the weight, put a band on your wrist and snap the band first to remove the negative thought before you actually put something in your mouth. Or it might be the opposite, You, like I did, you tried to get too skinny and you need to remove that thought, that negative thought of I'm only going to be fast if I'm really skinny. So what this is, it's a little, if you, I wish I had them, if you've got an elastic band and you flick it on your wrist, it sends a message to your brain that goes ouch and it short circuits whatever feeling you've got. And straight away you teach your athlete to replace it with something really positive. So if you snap the band, so for example, say you're going into a race and you feel like everyone in this race is so much faster than me. And I remember the first time I ran internationally and I was the only white girl with seven other incredible looking ripped, like I just felt like a complete, yeah, I wasn't supposed to be there. So this is an example when you would just snap the band and replace it straight away, you'd snap that negativity out and say, but I am actually going to win this race or I'm going to be the fastest in the race or something realistic, you know, I've trained really, really hard to be here, I deserve to be here. And it's the, the old filing cabinet scenario where if you replace the front of your, your brain with everything positive, slowly the negativity goes away. And this is the same situation. If you have an athlete that wins and wins and wins and wins and wins, what do they keep doing? Winning and winning and winning and winning and winning. It's like a snowball effect of winning and winning and winning and winning. So to get that mindset to happen for an athlete prior to the winning, we actually need to just make it like they are winning all the time. And what they're winning on is the mental front. So being able to actually win win and win and win because they're just making that positive association it comes back to the little voice in your head as well replace it with positive all the time all the time right comes down to you lift really well in the gym even if it's not necessarily a pb standing there for a second after you've lifted that weight and going i just did a great job and i challenge you guys to go home tonight and look in the mirror really close to the mirror and tell yourself how great you are as a coach and see how that feels how do you reckon it's going to feel it feels great but do you reckon it's uncomfortable initially like get yourself right up in the mirror. It's really hard. We make our athletes do. So we get right up in the mirror and say, "I am amazing at what I do." And you trust me, if you can, if you can keep eye contact with yourself and don't cry, you'll be, you'll be really unusual. Like it's a really strange thing, but please try when you get home. It's really interesting. Do it every night for a couple of weeks, and and, and, and very soon you'll feel like that is actually the truth, really through through your body. And it's the same as what we do. So it's self affirmation. Pardon? That's self affirmation. It's self affirmation, yeah. but it's a way to, to do it regularly. Yeah, that's so people, and this one is very, it's a very fast way to do it. So you can do a lot of the, like the night before you go to bed, what do you do well in the day? And all that. To me, it hasn't always worked because you're too tired. Yeah, this is quick because this happens at the moment you're there. You need to be, you need to have something that's on you all the time. And as soon as you feel that thought, you snap the band and recircuit that system. So yeah. So what we're going to do across that piece of paper, that last one is write across your page, is write I can across the page and then something that you do really well to make sure all those things that your group or you do um, that are holding you back is not going to happen. So right across the middle, you write I can or I will and do something that's going to change those things. So for me, it was I can change the way I behave off the track or I can, in medicine for example, um, I can make sure my life is balanced outside of my studies. Can you think of something? Yeah. <laughs>
I can be a more positive coach. I can, or I will, check in with my athlete every day that they are doing well. So I can attend more courses. I, something, Example, what they've written across. Keep learning. Keep learning. Yep, I'll keep learning. Yep. <coughs> communicate. Communicate. Love it. I'll communicate. Yep. Anyone else? One more. Be a good listener. Good listener. That's the best one. Very good. All right. So things changed. So I made. So I went to a course that did a very similar thing to this in 2011. After I, oh, would you believe? No, it was 2012. After I lost yet a third Olympics to injury. It's a classic. Um, yeah, to, the limit, to, to, to injury, and they said this, you've got to make a change. So I sat around, thought about it, felt sorry for myself, did the whole, oh, I'm never going to win the Olympics thing. And then I got an amazing call from Astrid Regenovich, who then offered me to go into bobsled. And I was lucky to do my entire career in bobsled differently from athletics. So stopping, smelling the roses, really enjoying the experience. And um, we made it to Sochi, and it was, in, it was incredible. We did crash that, I don't know if you saw that in the video. And um, does anyone want to guess what injury I got? You know, I'm sure, I don't know if you've ever seen bobs, there's a couple of bobsers with the beautiful big ice burns down their arms, and they're like, you want to show the grandkids what mummy did, I was a cool bobsetter. Yeah, do you want to guess what I did? I know, do you can't tell because you know. Do you want to guess? I can think about all the injuries. I've ruptured my Achilles, I've popped meniscus, I've broken my back. I've had to, had, does anyone want to guess in my athletics career how many in needles I had during my one, during my 14 years of athletics? Do you want to have just one guess? 60. Keep going. 200. Keep going. 556 injections. And we're not talking little ones, we're talking cortisones, hype, like um, trawmill injections, active agent injections. Yeah, it was just it was PRP, heaps and heaps of PRP. Yeah. A lot of injury, a lot of a lot of injuries during my athletics career. How many do you reckon I had during my bobsled career when I was happy, really well placed, studying medicine already? So I was, I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning, go to training for two hours, go straight to medical school, finish in the afternoon, hang out with my one kid at the time for a few hours, study till midnight and do it all again every day. No. So I'm talking no ability, exactly. Not a single injury the entire career. Running at 85 kilos on rock hard ice, lifting 110 kilos in the gym for a clean. I pound in my body like you've never seen. And I got no injuries. Happy, fast, yarn. It's really, really different. So fold up your little pieces of paper in the plane. That's your, it's your goal. It's what's going to hold you back. So, and it's also how you're going to achieve that goal with your group for the next, for the next five years. Do you remember how to make a paper plane? <laughs> That's it. Once you've finished, you've got to hold it up. And just like a whole heap of dreams are hopefully going to come true in this stadium in 46 days. Oh, there's some pretty cool paper planes. All right, everyone hold the planes up. And then just give it a throw. And as you throw, you're throwing away the problems and you're setting alight the dreams, okay? <laughs> All right. One final thing before I, I head off the clip. Yeah. What was the injury you got from the crash? Oh, what I what injury I got from the crash? I broke a fingernail. <laughs> That's it. That was it. <laughs> I knew cry. There was nothing, nothing wrong. <laughs> yeah. So one really important thing, we've touched on it a bit today already, but it's actually much harder when we get to the end of it. But I think it's really important to talk about. What do all these people have in common, guys? I'm sorry to bring up a slide of this and this at the end of the, of the session. But it kind of runs off a bit of what we were just talking about. Look at these two names and you can work it out. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're good. These are in the last 10 years, Olympic athletes, a lot of them gold medalists. Have passed away. Who committed suicide. Okay. Sorry to bring it up, but it's very poignant at the moment. Great quote by Kelly Holmes. And a really good book by both Olympic gold medalists. 
in the water they can't see you cry. It's really important as coaches to be aware of this. If it happens during a career and it can ruin and make you injured and lose performances, what do you think happens when you finish sport? And you can see how common it is in sport. And as coaches, it's, it's our opportunity to make this difference. One of the things I talked about before, oh, firstly, why is it, why has it happened? Obviously, A-type personality, sport is our identity. Like it becomes everything you are, everything you be, everything you do, everything you talk about, everything you dream of. And then you're addicted to the endorphins. And this is the part people forget. Endorphins are like drugs, they're brilliant. That's why we say to you know, people with depression, go and do exercise. But if you get an athlete, one who gets injured and has to stop straight away, or who finishes their career and you know, moves on and doesn't want to go to sport because they're so, like a lot of athletes finish track and field and don't even want to walk past the stadium because it hurts so much. So they stay away from sport. You're going to be so, so prone to this, this, this thing. So having balance is really important. So I know a lot of athletes, and Mike and I were talking about this this week, who don't go to, who stop training during university or do the opposite, don't, don't go to university because of training. So I did my HSC in Chile in an embassy when I was eight, 18. <laughs> yeah, and I had to get driven at two o'clock in the morning across the Australian embassy to actually sit my HSC exams during my World Juniors where I won double gold and then got 98 in my HSC. And it's, you say, but you can't do both. You can, it just takes a lot of work and a lot of discipline. But do you know what it did for me? It meant that I had something in sport and when everything was going well in sport, my academics maybe went down a little bit. When everything was going crap in sport, I had something else I loved to put my effort into. It's keeping that balance. So finding something straight away right now that your athlete loves, whether they're gonna be an Olympic champion or whether they're just gonna be a state level athlete, they have to have something else they love. It's essential in sport. The other big thing, as I was saying before, is responsibility. Let them have control over one session a week. I know it sounds like it's weird. Don't pick the session you think is the most important, clearly. <laughs> or understand that they have a guideline they have to pick between. But allowing them to know that they have responsibility throughout their whole career, I think, is essential because one of the biggest problems when we finish sport is we're so micromanaged that we don't know how to make decisions and we make shit ones. Drugs, alcohol, poor relationship choices, whatever that is, because we just don't have the ability. Because I said, everyone's, coach, what can I do? What can I eat? Who's this? Who's yeah. that? It's so finely tuned. I'll tell you, it's yeah. so finely tuned that it's really hard to make decisions and it backfires on so many athletes. It's one of those common things that comes out that they don't know how to progress into the next stage of life. So we need Would it be a good idea for the coach not to be there at that particular session? The no, no, they don't. Gosh, no, you won't want to, because then what if they go and do 100 reps of 100, 400 or something? So, so the coach should be there. Yeah, you, you, like for, you wouldn't want to give me that and not watch it because I'd be like, I'll do 16, 600 or something stupid. So, so the, yeah, the, so the coach, coach might there. need to intervene. Yeah, exactly. It's just having, it's just giving that, the athlete some control over there and, rela and a relationship with you to have, a, okay. to have an input into their program. Okay. Yep. Just an interesting observation. You've blown me away today. A lot of people wouldn't know. Yeah, our relationship. We've, had. we've known each other for as long as my career runs. And this is <laughs> an incredible example of how youth is wasted on the young. Yeah, I know. You, okay you, now, you right could, now. I couldn't have foreseen you give this talk yeah. in 2006. Oh. I couldn't have seen that you would have that um, understanding of your own mistakes and where things. Go, but it's a shame. I wish I'd done it there. <laughs> but we're all there. We've, yeah, all, exactly. we've all been there. We're all in our own lives. We're all so, geez, wouldn't it have be been great if I yeah. knew what I know now? Yeah, exactly. Then, Which is why I'm trying to give it. It's hard. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I am still heartbroken by my career. That is not going to go away. So trying to make sure that people are aware that I still have days where I'm literally in tears. And like, even I have to be honest, with being in the stadium is hard because mm. I miss it so much. Oh, God. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. But you've got to have a plan B because it's really painful when you finish. And I don't feel this way. <laughs> to make sure that that hasn't, that we don't have a Jared Bannister situation that is end, ends up feeling like it's part of your responsibility. We need to encourage their academic. Yep, encourage academia. It's really important and it's really doable. As I said, it's actually fabulous to have something outside of athletics that when it's not going well, you have something you really love and their performance can really draw on that strength. I remember actually, classic example is I was standing on the top of a bobsled track in Austria about five years ago and was so nervous at the performance because it was one of my first races and I was standing there thinking, I can't do this, I can't do this, what if I stuff it up, what if I miss the timing and Astra doesn't want me to slide with her and all this sort of stuff. And I just said, no, but it doesn't matter. If you screw up right now, tomorrow you're going to be a doctor. Who cares? And I was like, oh, you're right. And straight away those feelings disappeared. And then I, and I slept really well and made the Olympics. 
but it's having that ability to uh, to have a plan B. What about another option? I like to encourage an interest in the arts, whether yeah, they play brilliant. music or they like to paint or look at paintings in galleries. Yeah. It's a, it's something else that's different to academics. It's different to sport, but it's still a, a love. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yep. Anybody else? Good support systems in place. Huge one. Community, yep. Professional, yep. outside of the um, athletic environment. Yep. What about just talking to them and making them aware that it's going to happen? Because we, we see it in the press all the time. So being really aware that it's going to happen and that there's many of us that are prepared to stand up and say it. So therefore it's making sure that they, they understand that they are one of a big group of people that it is completely normal to feel very vulnerable in that afterlife period. And I spoke to, as you guys will know, Rowan Robinson was my partner for many years and I spoke to him only last week and he's still struggling with it 10 years after retirement. So I'm four or three years out and it's still hard. <laughs> well, let's build on that. Social support. The biggest predictor mm -hmm. of mental health is actually social isolation. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, and quite often you hear when people commit suicide, the people around them go, I had no idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, how could you not know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's part of modern society. We just don't have deep and meaningful relationships and, um, and the more deep and meaningful relationships somebody has with others and belong to more than one group that's why you need to have multiple identities yes exactly uh, the more you have a buffer mm -hmm. right but when you put all your eggs into one basket you have a single identity and then that's taken away from you and exactly. you don't have strong yeah. deep relationships you're there you're acquaintances but they're not friends mm -hmm. yeah you know so and social so support and a way of building social support and you as a coach actually are providing that social support and you, hit the nail, yeah. and you hit the nail on the head too because we also encourage our athletes not to go out, not to drink, not to do all the sort of environment where they're going to build those networks. So as a coach, you really are that. So, That's what I, I was going to raise. So just, I tend to, just by what they are, who they are, they yes. tend to hang with other athletes. I know. Yeah. And that's hard too because it's hard to be around people that are still achieving. Like I look at, I don't mind being, I'm very honest today. <laughs> I, don't mind, I think one of my reasons my marriage was so hard was that I was married to a man whose career was failing while mine was succeeding. I was winning world titles while my husband was, was so I won the Commonwealth Games three and a half minutes after he lost and came last in his Commonwealth final, but he was reigning more Commonwealth champion going into that event. How much courage that must have taken for him to walk off the track and give me a genuine hug. Like that would have, like it's only now, it was only until I wrote my book actually that I realized how much of an impact that must have had on that guy. Cause he was, you know, he went off the rails very badly. But now I know as an off the rails athlete myself, how it feels, <laughs> you know, like that, oh. And being in the same household as a champion would have been, oh. Like a lot. But, but um, sorry, just thinking like this as a reflective tool, like a target for me, I see it as that who are you to yourself, who are you in your family and to others, and who are you in the broader community? Yeah. So, um, but for me, I've been indi yeah. being Indigenous, it's making sure that those connections yeah. are always connected so that if something's going wrong, that you are, you know, yeah. somehow connected to either yourself enough to know that something's going wrong. To your family, to know that you talk to them, and to community where you can go and for the support that you need. It's something like right that. It's not always going to be the answer, yep. but it's at least a tool to. And maybe just checking in regularly with your athletes. So maybe make it. Maybe you could take. What if the only thing you take away from today is that every three months or every six months you need to check in with them and see what's going on, and have a like a sit, literally a sit down. Of what's going on in life? What are you preparing outside of this to do? And especially if you're an older athlete or an injured athlete, what. What is your next step going to be and who is your social and support network? And maybe we do need to relax a little bit on the going out with friends scenario and creating that social well, network. Well, that's part of the problem, just control. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's the micromanagement, it's the control again, see? And, 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 and going back to the, uh, the skin folds, it's just this obsession with numbers. Know, is it numbers obsession. and truth? You know, we've got to change that. Yes, because we do. that sort of creates the obsessive, particularly the type A personality. Yeah. Sorry. So, do you mind reading through my opinion?